Hello and welcome back to the Loud Girl Talks History podcast where I talk about all things history and basically just gossip about famous dead people. If you missed the first two episodes, go check it out. It's on the delightful King Henry VIII. Also subscribe to the podcast, leave a review and like the podcast as well. Today we're talking about Cleopatra, the real life Cersei Lannister. To all the Game of Thrones fans, we all know that George R.R. R. Martin, the writer of Game of Thrones, took a lot of inspiration from the events and historical figures from the Wars of the Roses. So people have drawn similarities and comparisons between Cersei Lannister and the female real life characters of the Wars of the Roses, like Margaret of Anjou and Elizabeth Woodville. Today though, I'm going to be bucking the trend and throughout this podcast, I'm going to argue how I believe that the actual real life closest comparison that can and should be made regarding the character of Cersei Lannister is actually the Egyptian pharaoh and last Ptolemaic ruler of Egypt, Cleopatra. Both of them are beautiful sex symbols, incestuous femme fatales who met their end in the political struggle and conflict with invading foreigners. In episode 3, I'm going to take you through the life of Cleopatra VII Philippata and convince you that rather than the female figures of the Wars of the Roses, Cersei Lannister is, in fact, most closely aligned with the infamous historical figure of our Cleopatra. Now, here I want to insert a disclaimer. The life of Cleopatra takes place in the last century BC, which is over 2,000 years ago. And this means that a lot of historical evidence and materials that would give you a really detailed portrayal of Cleopatra and her biography are lost to history. So from the books and articles I've read, we're really relying on coins that have been discovered by archaeologists and biographies from Roman histories who naturally have a biased, rather bad opinion of Cleopatra, which lasts into the centuries. Hence, I'll be using a lot of maybes, possibly, likely in this episode, because we just don't know exactly what happened. We're using a lot of inferences from the evidence that we have. Also, please excuse the bad pronunciation of any names in the story. But without further ado, let's talk about Cleopatra the Seventh Philippator, the real life Cersei Lannister. Cleopatra the Seventh was born in 69 BC to Pharaoh Ptolemy the Twelfth of Egypt. She had an older sister, Berenice, and three younger siblings, Arsinoe and two Ptolemies. Cleopatra and her family came from a long lineage of Ptolemies. The Ptolemaic family tree can be traced right back to the first Ptolemy, who was a companion of Alexander the Great, the Greek king who came from Macedonia and conquered huge territories around the world. After Alexander the Great died in 323 BC, his companions, i.e. his closest friends and generals, carved up the conquered territory to rule for themselves. Ptolemy got Egypt and became Pharaoh Ptolemy I Sota in 305 or 304 BC. So the rulers of Egypt under the Ptolemies were actually of Greek descent, and so was Cleopatra. Cleopatra could boast her ancestral ties to Alexander the Great on two sides, as Cleopatra's great-great-grandfather Ptolemy V married into the Seleucid Empire, and their founder was also a companion of Alexander the Great. Here we can make our first comparison between Cersei and Cleopatra because neither woman's ancestors were quote-unquote meant to rule over the lands that they did. Cleopatra's ancestor Ptolemy I took over Egypt and ruled for himself by virtue of his relationship with Alexander the Great. In comparison, the founder of House Lannister, Lan the Clever, tricked House Castley out of the lands that they held at Castley Rock. So we see both Cersei and Cleopatra's ancestors taking lands and titles effectively by force and establishing long dynasties for their successors. And taking things by force would be character traits that Cersei and Cleopatra would share in their own stories. Anyway, back to Ptolemy. Ptolemy I and his successors conquered more and more lands beyond Egypt to form the Ptolemaic Empire. By the time Cleopatra was born in 69 BC, though, the Ptolemaic Empire was no longer at its peak. Over the years, the conquered territories were lost again to other rivals and ancient Rome was becoming a massive global superpower. 
with Egyptian kings becoming increasingly dependent on the Roman Republic for their own security, both in terms of ensuring their safety on the Egyptian throne and safety from invasion from the formidable Roman army as well. Cleopatra's father, Ptolemy XII, had a relatively pro-Roman policy. He knew that he had to keep Rome sweet if he was to keep his own grasp on the Egyptian throne, and amongst many, there are two main reasons for this. Number one, one Ptolemy, either Ptolemy X or Ptolemy XI, we're not sure, owed Rome so much money that he left the whole of Egypt to Rome in his will. And this gave Rome a legal claim to the Egyptian throne. Essentially, if Rome wanted to invade Egypt, they had a legal excuse for this. And number two, Ptolemy XII was commonly known among the Egyptian people as Nothos, or bastard, because he was. Ptolemy XII wasn't really destined or supposed to be pharaoh. When Ptolemy IX died in 81 BC, he was succeeded by no less than three Egyptian pharaohs who died within months of each other. And the only option really was to install the 20-year-old Ptolemy XII to the Egyptian throne. Ptolemy XII was a cousin to the previous Ptolemy XI, who had been killed in a riot against him for killing his cousin and stepmother after just a month of married bliss. It's noted by historians that at the time, the Alexandrian people had a real tendency to voice their discontent at their ruler's actions by rioting and killing them. Sure enough, the Alexandrian people started to grow really discontented with Cleopatra's father, Ptolemy XII, and for some reason or another, he fled from Egypt. There were several possible causes for this. Number one, the Roman army that was led by Cato the Younger annexed Cyprus, and Cyprus at the time was being ruled by Ptolemy XII's brother, who was also called Ptolemy, which isn't confusing at all. Our Ptolemy, Cleopatra's father, Ptolemy XII, failed to come to the rescue of his brother or even say anything in support of his brother because he didn't want to risk the wrath of the Romans. Ultimately, Ptolemy of Cyprus ended up committing suicide because of his defeat against the Romans, and this supposedly caused the outrage of the Alexandrian people at what they saw as Ptolemy's mistreatment of his brother. Also, Ptolemy had been raising taxes in Egypt, and a large reason behind this was that he owed the Romans a lot of money. From borrowing money from Rome and showing no defiance to Rome when they went against his own brother, Ptolemy XII really tried to show himself as Rome's friend. And this did kind of pay off, because in 59 BC, Ptolemy was officially declared Rome's friend and ally, which meant that Ptolemy can now confidently rely on Rome's protection. Whatever the reason, the situation in Egypt was clearly so dangerous for Ptolemy that he fled Egypt altogether in 58 BC. Ptolemy first went to Rhodes in Greece, and then on to Rome to seek aid in order to regain the Egyptian throne, and Cleopatra was probably with her father during this time. While he was gone, Ptolemy's elder daughter, Berenice, became co-ruler of Egypt with Cleopatra VI, who may have been our Cleopatra's sister or mother, we can't be sure. But soon after the start of their reign, Cleopatra VI died, leaving Berenice the sole ruler. The idea of women being the sole ruler in Egypt was completely unacceptable to the people, and people were scrambling in order to find a suitable husband for Berenice. It took them four tries for a guy who eventually kind of stuck. One mysteriously died, another was considered but ultimately disregarded, and one was killed because Berenice found him so annoying. Berenice did end up marrying a man who she didn't kill by the name of Archelaus, which good for him. But meanwhile, Rome was still deciding what to do about Egypt and how to restore Ptolemy to the throne. After all, it was in Rome's interests to restore Ptolemy. He still owed the Roman bankers a lot of money, and the way to get that money back would be for Ptolemy to be back in power in Egypt they could also make a lot more money from Ptolemy. They agreed to help Ptolemy regain the Egyptian throne for 10,000 talents, which approximately is a year or so's worth of all the revenue in Egypt. So the Roman army, led by Aulus Gabinius, marched into Egypt in 55 BC with the aim of reinstating Ptolemy onto the Egyptian throne. 
Berenice's husband, Archelaus, led the Egyptian army to engage in battle with them, but he was ultimately defeated and killed in battle. The Roman army had won, and Ptolemy XII was now back on top. The first order of business for Ptolemy now was to punish the people who had gone against him in Egypt. Ptolemy ordered the execution of his daughter's allies, and the execution of his daughter Berenice. And that might seem a bit cruel or too harsh of a punishment to put on your daughter, but the Ptolemaic family had a long history of killing family members and pitting family member against family member in order to gain more power. And that in fighting and ability to kill your own family members isn't just reserved for the Ptolemies. Throughout history, you'll be able to see that within the royal family in fighting, people are incredibly prepared to kill their own family members if that means that they'll be able to fulfil their own political ambitions and gain more power and influence within their own kingdoms. But now that Ptolemy was pharaoh again, he had to settle the matter of succession. Cleopatra was the closest to adulthood at 14, while the rest of Ptolemy's children were literally children. His sons were six and four at the time of his restoration, and Arsinoe was again, still a child. In his will, Ptolemy stated that Cleopatra and his eldest son, Ptolemy XIII, would be joint heirs upon his death. The will also asked the Roman people to act as guardians over the children, which just goes to show how much trust Ptolemy was putting in Rome in order to help him and his family retain power in Egypt. So when in 151 BC, Ptolemy XII passed away, the Egyptian throne passed on to his eldest son, who became Ptolemy XIII, and his eldest surviving daughter, who became Cleopatra VII. Now, when she ascended to the Egyptian throne, Cleopatra had taken over the rule of the richest, most ancient and longest established kingdom in the world. The Egyptian crown had state monopolies on a lot of trade industries. The Ptolemies had control over agriculture in the areas of the River Nile, which was historically lucrative for Egypt. The River Nile would flood the banks every summer, and when the river would go back and recede, it would uncover ground that was really fertile for the production of grain. The papyrus plant also grew in Egypt, which could be used for paper and then exported on. Egypt also exported a number of goods, including textiles, precious stones, perfumes and spices. Egypt had lots of trade relations with countries from Asia in the east, including India and countries like Italy and Greece to the west. Egypt was really well placed in the sense that in the east was all of these Asian countries and then to the west were all the European countries where Egypt could just create more and more revenue through being that intermediary. All of this trade made Egypt an incredibly wealthy kingdom, which was greatly coveted by Rome. However, Cleopatra had to share control over this abundant state with her brother, who she married. Sibling marriages were commonplace in Egyptian royalty. The pharaohs were considered intermediaries between the Egyptian people and the gods, and the pharaohs had divine statuses because of that. To keep the bloodline pure and also to preserve power within Egypt to the exclusive control of the Ptolemies, marriage between siblings were definitely not unusual. But this was not a love match. By the time that they became co-rulers, Cleopatra was 18 and Ptolemy was only 10. Cleopatra had gone through all the awkward stages of puberty and Ptolemy hadn't even entered into it yet. The age gap was just too big for any romantic love to foster between the siblings and also let's not forget that they were brother and sister the relationship between the siblings made them more competitors than any love whether that be fraternal or romantic between them and we'll see that there was a real intense sibling rivalry between Cleopatra and her brothers and sister 
Also, because Ptolemy was only 10 when he came to the throne, he was advised by a regency council, but in reality it was the council who held power and they were making the decisions in the 10-year-old king's name. So from the beginning really, co-rule meant a power struggle between Cleopatra, who was of age and therefore didn't need a regency council, and Ptolemy alongside his regency council, and neither intended the other to hold real power or influence in the long term. Co-rule between Cleopatra and Ptolemy was essentially a ticking time bomb and it only needed one event for one or the other to be overthrown. But for the moment at least, Cleopatra and Ptolemy were co-rulers and Cleopatra made sure that she was very much seen and heard by the Alexandrian people as their new queen. On the 22nd of March 51 BC, Cleopatra attended a ceremony in Hermonthus to celebrate the installation of the new Bacchus Bull. This was an important event because bulls were worshipped by Egyptian people and the Bacchus Bull was considered the intermediary between the people and the god Montu. Cleopatra also used religious imagery to present herself as the earthly incarnation of the goddess Isis, the goddess of agriculture, harvest and marriage. The goddess Isis can be compared with the Roman goddess Venus or the Greek goddess Aphrodite. Cleopatra would be depicted as the goddess Isis throughout much of her reign, if not all of it, in coinage, statues and portraits and on state occasions she would really dress like her. While Cleopatra tried to make herself seem like the living goddess of agriculture and harvest, the actual harvest situation in Egypt was far from ideal. In the early years of Cleopatra's reign, there was drought and food shortages, and this led to a royal order in 50 BC that demanded the grain that was produced in Egypt to be transported to Alexandria for the Egyptian government to control under pain of death. Within two years of co-ruling, it seemed that Cleopatra was well and truly displaced from her rule as co-ruler, as in official documents, only Ptolemy's name starts appearing towards the end of 49 BC, and it's possible that Cleopatra actually fled Alexandria during this time because the political situation in Egypt and the dominant power of her brother and his regency council meant that her life was in danger. She could have fled to Ashkelon, a nearby city-state where Cleopatra had political allies. Evidence for Cleopatra's refuge in Ashkelon is supported by the city putting Cleopatra's head on their coins around this time. And in Ashkelon, Cleopatra could now go about finding support and raising an army to reclaim her position on the Egyptian throne. Back in Egypt, where Ptolemy XIII was essentially the sole ruler with Cleopatra out of the way, Roman politics had started becoming a problem. At the time, Rome was known as the Roman Republic, which was basically ruled by three guys who formed the Triumvirate, and each guy would be called a Triumvir. They were Pompey the Great, Marcus Licinius Crassus, known as the richest man in Rome, and Julius Caesar. Crassus, though, died in the Battle of Carre during his war against the Parthian Empire, a formidable power in ancient Iran. This led to civil war in the Roman Republic between Pompey the Great and Julius Caesar to fight for sole leadership. This conflict spilled over to involve Egypt when Pompey was defeated by Caesar at the Battle of Pharsalus in Greece. Pompey fled to Egypt as a base to continue civil war and sent a messenger ahead of him to tell Ptolemy that he was coming. This made for a little bit of a political conundrum for Ptolemy and his advisers. They didn't really want to get involved in the civil war, but they didn't exactly have a choice. Now Pompey was clearly going to lose a war and so coming to Egypt to renew his efforts for the Roman civil war posed a bit of a problem for Egypt. Pompey ended up safely reaching Egypt, where he was met by Ptolemy's men. As Pompey landed into Egypt, though, he was killed by a Lucius Septimius under the orders of Ptolemy XIII and his Regency Council. And this was probably the wisest decision that Ptolemy could have made, because it was clear that Pompey was going to lose the war, and so welcoming him with open arms when Caesar was coming for them just wasn't a good look. Four days later, Caesar arrived in Alexandria and was presented with Pompey's head. 
Then Caesar installed himself in the royal palace at Alexandria and reminded Egypt that Rome was still owed a lot of money from Ptolemy XII's debt. And he stated that he was here in Egypt to ensure that the previous king's will was upheld. This was a golden opportunity for Cleopatra now to use her political skills and prowess in order to regain her position in Egypt. Cleopatra took the opportunity to return to Alexandria and try to get Caesar on her side. And there's the infamous story of Cleopatra being smuggled into Caesar's quarters by being rolled up in a carpet. And then as soon as Caesar was alone, the carpet was unrolled and out came the beautiful young queen Cleopatra. And Plutarch, a Roman historian, provides a really detailed description of Cleopatra. He says... The charm of her presence was irresistible, and there was an attraction in her person and her talk, together with a peculiar force of character which pervaded her every word and action, and laid all those who associated with her under its spell. It was a delight merely to hear the sound of her voice, with which, like an instrument of many strings, she could pass from one language to another, so that she seldom required an interpreter, whether they were Ethiopians, Troglodytes, Hebrews, Arabians, Syrians, Medes of Parthians. And from Plutarch's account, Cleopatra is characterised as this really charismatic, captivating queen who was really intelligent and knew a lot of languages beyond simply Greek and Egyptian. So it's no surprise that when a very beautiful, intelligent, 21, 22 year old woman who happens to just appear out of thin air or out of a carpet, Caesar, who was in his 50s at the time, was instantly attracted and unsurprisingly, they soon began an affair. The next day, Ptolemy found out what had happened between Caesar and Cleopatra the night before and flew into a panicky rage, knowing that now Caesar would be politically biased towards Cleopatra. He flung his royal diadem on the floor and tried to incite the crowd into violence against Cleopatra and Caesar. However, Caesar's men dragged Ptolemy back inside the palace and Caesar had to calm down the crowd using his public speaking skills. Caesar pronounced Cleopatra and Ptolemy as co-rulers, celebrating with a banquet and also giving Cyprus back to the Ptolemies by having Cleopatra's younger siblings, Arsinoe and Ptolemy, rule over it. But in mid-November 48 BC, this uneasy truce was falling apart. Caesar found out that Achilles, one of Ptolemy's guardians, was approaching Alexandria with 20,000 men in order to oust Caesar and Cleopatra from Egypt. In Alexandria, Caesar was outnumbered five to one, and he had to quickly request other countries to help him out with reinforcements. Meanwhile, Caesar and the Egyptian royal family were essentially stuck in the royal palace of Alexandria as they were under attack by Achilles. Achilles' assault on Alexandria became what is now known as the Alexandrian War. Caesar fought back by taking over specific Alexandrian sites, essentially just wrecking them and repurposing them, doing a bit of DIY to use them as strategic military bases and defences. There was also a fleet of Egyptian ships that were docked at the harbour and Caesar decided that it would be best not to risk Achilles taking over them and use them for himself in the war and so he burnt them all. Apparently the fire got so out of control that it spread to the library where hundreds of written works were lost forever. Also, amidst all of the chaos and madness that was going on, Cleopatra's little sister Arsinoe managed to somehow escape from the royal palace and went over to Achilles' side with her advisor and tutor Ganymedes. When she got there, she was declared the rightful co-ruler of Egypt with Ptolemy, but... Almost immediately, Achilles and Ganymedes became rivals, and amidst the power struggle, Achilles ended up being murdered, and that left Ganymedes in control of the Egyptian army. In a weird move in the war, Caesar actually freed Ptolemy and told him to go over to Achilles' side, but to take control of the Egyptian army. Caesar may have had a hidden motive behind freeing Ptolemy. He knew that Achilles was working in the name of Ptolemy and Caesar would have expected Ptolemy to just go over to their side completely. 
But Caesar may have wanted conflict on the inside. Because Arsinoe was there and declared queen, the appearance of Ptolemy might cause sibling rivalry between Ptolemy and Arsinoe, which would weaken the enemy side from the inside. What actually happened though was that Ptolemy and Arsinoe ended up working together and it seemed like the Egyptian army under the command of Ptolemy and Arsinoe could seriously threaten Caesar and Cleopatra. But luckily for them, in March 47 BC, reinforcements started arriving in Egypt in order to support Caesar. They made their way to Alexandria, but on the way they attacked Ptolemy's military bases. On the 27th of March, the decisive battle took place, where ultimately Caesar and the Roman army emerged victorious. Ptolemy ended up fleeing by boat, but it capsized and he was later found drowned in the River Nile. Cleopatra stayed queen, but as it was unacceptable for a woman to be the sole ruler in Egypt, Caesar put her younger half-brother, Ptolemy XIV, on the throne as well as her co-ruler. Caesar remained in Alexandria after he won the Alexandrian War, accompanying Cleopatra on a cruise up the River Nile as a sort of royal progress to be seen and heard by the Alexandrian people once again and to inspire the public's love for Cleopatra. A temple called the Caesarium was built in Caesar's honour as well by Cleopatra. Eventually, though, Caesar had to leave Alexandria and he had to return to Rome. He decided to take one legion of forces with him, which is approximately three to six thousand soldiers, and he left the other three legions to Cleopatra. Taking into account that Cleopatra had only just been reinstalled onto the Egyptian throne, Caesar and Cleopatra must have thought it the wisest decision to have Roman military support backing her. Caesar left Alexandria and took with him the imprisoned Arsinoe back to Rome, and when they got there, Arsinoe had to take part in a Roman triumph. And a Roman triumph is this ceremony where the victor who's recently won the battle, which is in this case Caesar, re-enters Rome in a victorious manner, and the prisoners that have been captured are in chains, paraded around, and has to really act respectfully and obediently to the victor. And this is what happened to us in a way. And for a member of the most illustrious royal family in the world, this must have been so humiliating and mortifying. And to see the image of this poor young girl in such a humiliating and depressing situation really invoked the pity of the Roman people. It was normal for prisoners to be killed after they took part in a triumph, but luckily for us in a way, she was sent into exile to the temple of Artemis, which is in modern-day Turkey. While the Alexandrian War was going on, Cleopatra found out that she was pregnant. On the 23rd of June, 47 BC, Cleopatra gave birth to a son who she named Ptolemy Caesar. And through her son's name, Cleopatra was clearly telling the world that this little boy was Julius Caesar's child. Cleopatra's son was nicknamed Caesarian, which means Little Caesar, by the Egyptian people, and that's the name he's most commonly known by in history. Soon after Caesar returned to Rome, Cleopatra decided to pay him a visit with Caesarian and her new co-ruler brother, Ptolemy XIV. There may have been personal reasons for Cleopatra's trip, but she also had a political purpose as well. She had to settle what the relationship between Egypt and Rome was going to be from now on. And when she got there, Cleopatra was very graciously hosted by Caesar in his own house. She also successfully concluded a treaty with Rome, where Cleopatra and her co-ruler brother were legally named friendly and allied monarchs. Cleopatra was given another honour. Her statue was installed at the Temple of Venus, where she was depicted as the goddess Isis, which is something that very few women were given the honour of in that time. Cleopatra stayed in Rome for two whole years doing God knows what, because we don't know. Um, She may have gone back to Alexandria while Caesar went away to fight Pompey the Great's sons in Spain, who were trying to avenge their father's death, but we really don't know for sure. What we do know, though, was that Cleopatra was in Rome when Caesar was assassinated, 
and he was assassinated by his own senators on the Ides of March, and we all know how that story goes. So, in April 44 BC, Cleopatra left Rome with her son, co-ruler brother, and entourage to return to Alexandria. Personally, I really don't know how you can leave your own kingdom for two years, but hey, that's just me. Uh, Cleopatra may have just left trusted advising in charge while she was in Rome. A few months later, though, the boy king Ptolemy the Fourteenth was dead. Cleopatra may well have had Ptolemy killed, since he was ultimately going to be a threat to her power in Egypt especially when he became of age so she definitely had a motive to kill him but this is unconfirmed also Ptolemy's death meant that Cleopatra could very conveniently put her son Caesarion on the Egyptian throne as her co-ruler now Cleopatra was undeniably in full control of the Egyptian throne and here comes the second similarity that we can draw with Circe Cleopatra had an immense love for her children as Tyrion said it one of Cersei's only redeeming qualities. Cersei Lannister killed her husband, King Robert, so that she could assume control of the Iron Throne in Westeros through her son Joffrey, although it didn't exactly work out as well for Cersei as it did for Cleopatra. Cersei, though, just has this unmovable love and adoration for her children, just like Cleopatra did. Likewise, Cleopatra might have killed her husband, Ptolemy XIV, so that she could put her son, Caesarion, on the Egyptian throne as her co-ruler and gain full control over the kingdom for herself and her children. Throughout both Circe and Cleopatra's stories, they'd constantly work to secure their future and their children's futures as well. Anyway, Egypt was involved in Roman politics yet again. After the assassination of Caesar, two factions started forming. One faction was led by Caesar's assassins, Brutus and Cassius, who fled Rome, and the other faction was led by Caesar's supporters, including Mark Antony and Octavian. In 43 BC, the second triumvirate was formed by Mark Antony, Octavian and Marcus Aemilius Lepidus and the trio worked together to defeat Caesar's assassins. Now both sides contacted Cleopatra and demanded support from her saying that they were the rightful authorities of the Roman Republic and Egypt should support their cause. Given that Brutus and Cassius had killed her lover and baby daddy, it was natural that Cleopatra wasn't going to support them. She gave the excuse that she didn't have any money or resources spare because of the failed harvest that year. And that wasn't exactly a lie. The grain production in Egypt that year just wasn't up to scratch like the previous years. But if she really wanted to help them, she definitely had the ships and the soldiers available to do so. In fact, Cleopatra was planning on leading a fleet of Egyptian ships to Mark Antony's fleet. Cassius caught wind of this and got his ships to engage in battle, but Cleopatra's fleet had to retreat because there was a storm and her ships were really damaged and there's a story that goes round that Cleopatra got seasickness, which is another reason why they had to retreat. By the time that Cleopatra could go back to sea with her fleet, her ships were no longer needed. In autumn 42 BC, the Battle of Philippi was the decisive battle where Mark Antony won against Brutus and Cassius, and in the end, they committed suicide. Octavian, Antony and Lepidus divided the Roman Empire up between themselves to rule. Octavian had control of Rome and the centre of Europe, Lepidus took the western part of the Roman Empire, and Antony had the east. Soon after, though, Octavian forced Lepidus into retirement and took over control of the west. Now that the war was won, Antony headed east and summoned Cleopatra to him so that she could answer accusations against her of helping Caesar's assassins during the civil war. Cleopatra sailed to Tarsus, which is in modern-day Turkey where Antony was, and invited Antony and his retinue to board her ship for dinner. Cleopatra whined and dined Antony for four evenings straight, and one thing just led to another and Cleopatra and Antony became lovers. Just like Cleopatra used her relationship with Caesar to get what she wanted politically, she did exactly the same with her relationship with Antony. Antony wanted help from Cleopatra to provide resources and manpower for his war against the Parthian Empire. In return though, Cleopatra demanded that her sister Arsinoe, who had been imprisoned in the Temple of Artemis and the only person left who could threaten her position on the Egyptian throne, be executed. 
uh, this condition was accepted by Antony. Again, this might seem really ruthless and cutthroat in ancient Egypt, but it was really every person for themselves. Whether you were related or not did not matter. And if the tables were turned, if Arsinoe had been on the winning side, it would have been a very unsurprising move for her to order the execution of Cleopatra. Also, Cleopatra became pregnant by Antony in the winter of 41 to 40 BC. Antony wasn't there for the birth though, because he quickly had to leave in early 40 BC to fight an attack against the Parthians. Where still, Antony found out that his wife Fulvia and his brother Lucius Antonius had started and ultimately lost a war against Octavian after picking a fight with him. Fulvia fled to Greece to see Antony, but she died shortly after she arrived. Antony now had to make up with Octavian, and they concluded a treaty where they extended their tenure as members of the Triumvirate, and Antony would marry Octavian's sister, Octavia. So, Antony effectively abandoned Cleopatra in Egypt, and was now playing house with his new wife, Octavia, fathering their two children, who would both be named Antonia. Back in Egypt, Cleopatra gave birth to not one, but two children in autumn 40 BC, and Cleopatra named her twins Alexander and Cleopatra. Not only were Cleopatra's personal relationships changing, her political relationships were undergoing transformation as well. The Parthians had invaded Syria and then Judea, where the lives of the two princes, Phasael and Herod, were in danger. And if you're thinking the name Herod sounds familiar... Yes, he was the one who tried to kill baby Jesus. But at the time that we meet Herod, at this point, he hasn't tried to kill loads of babies yet. At this point, Herod managed to escape, but his brother and father were killed as a result of the Parthian invasion. Prince Herod went to Egypt and met with Cleopatra, where she supposedly gave him a ship so that Herod could go on to Rome and seek help. She didn't really see Prince Herod as a threat because at that time he was poor and powerless, but she might later have regretted the decision of having been so hospitable. Because when Prince Herod appealed to Rome for help, the triumvirate not only reinstated Herod's claim to Judea, but also made him king. The triumvirate helped Herod take back Judea with Roman troops, making Herod king of Judea and through his newfound importance and power in the east, a serious rival and threat to Cleopatra and Egypt's power. Judea was at one point part of the Ptolemaic Empire and Cleopatra was ambitious to regain the territory that was lost and restore her kingdom's former glory. Cleopatra did find an opportunity to expand her kingdom in 37 BC though. Antony, having renewed the triumvirate until the end of 33 BC, decided that now was the time to restart the war against the Parthians. He left his wife Octavia in Italy so that he could lead the war, and as soon as his wife was out of sight, out of mind, Antony sent a messenger to summon Cleopatra. Cleopatra went to see Antony in Antioch, Greece, with her twins Alexander and Cleopatra, who were three at the time, and this was the first time that Antony had ever seen his and Cleopatra's children. Again, there were political needs behind this meeting between Antony and Cleopatra. Antony needed the resources that Cleopatra could provide so that he could revive the war against the Parthians. Cleopatra wanted to gain more territory for herself in Egypt, and they very quickly struck an agreement. Conveniently though, Mark Antony was planning to rearrange the Eastern Territories anyway and give them to rulers who were allied to Rome. And Cleopatra made an obvious choice. She was, after all, the ruler of the richest, most powerful kingdom allied to Rome. So Antony gave numerous cities and regions back to Egyptian control, to the point where, under Cleopatra's reign, Egypt was almost fully restored to when the Ptolemaic Kingdom was at its golden age, except for one territory, Judea. Again, Cleopatra's exploitation of her relationships with powerful men to further her political aspirations draws parallels with Cersei Lannister. In a conversation with Sansa Stark, when they're being attacked by Stannis Baratheon, Cersei rather crudely says, look, you've got to use the greatest asset you have, the thing between your legs, if you want to get ahead in life. I think the exact quote was, tears aren't a woman's only weapon, the best one's between your legs. But 
you can see that Cersei really lives by these words. Cersei seduces her own brother Jaime to get him to stay in King's Landing as she wants, and she marries King Robert Baratheon, becoming the most powerful woman in the kingdom of Westeros. It seems that Cleopatra shared this view of using your femininity to boost your political standing. Cleopatra and Cersei have reputations in their own world of being beautiful, beguiling women. And pillow talk is a very powerful thing to get someone to do what you want. And that's shown by both Cleopatra and Cersei's rise to power. When Cleopatra asked for territory from Antony, he usually gave except for Judea. Instead, other allied kingdoms had to surrender their lands to give to Cleopatra on Antony's orders. For instance, King Herod had to give up these groves near Jericho, and they were really important because they brought in a substantial amount of revenue from its plantations of date palms and balsam shrubs. But while Cleopatra was given these territories by Antony, it doesn't look like she exercised actual political control there. These territories were more useful because of the revenue and profits that they yielded. Cleopatra could lease these lands back to its former owners, like King Herod, as another stream of income for Egypt. These lands also had lots of forests and woods, which Cleopatra could use to build ships for Antony to use in his Parthian campaign. In 36 BC, Antony made his way to begin the Parthian invasion and Cleopatra went with him for part of the way before returning to Alexandria. One possible reason for this was that Cleopatra was pregnant again and she would ultimately give birth to a son named Ptolemy Philadelphus. In the meantime, Antony's expedition to invade Parthia was an absolute disaster. Antony needed the support of two kingdoms, Medea and Armenia, to be able to continue on his way to reach Parthia. Artavardes of Armenia pledged his support to Antony, but he ended up double-crossing Antony and attacked the Roman army. With winds approaching, Antony had no choice but to turn back and stop the Parthian campaign, at least for now. Antony's army arrived in Syria and he sent a message to Cleopatra to meet him there. In January 35 BC, Cleopatra came to the rescue of Antony and his army with supplies so that Antony could provide money and clothing for his army. Antony and Cleopatra then returned to Alexandria, which would be their base for the next three years, and Antony fully intended on kickstarting a renewed campaign against Parthia. Antony pretended that everything had gone well and sent messages to Rome saying that he'd won a victory. Rome wasn't convinced at all, but celebrated Antony's victory against Parthia all the same. Also, Antony's wife Octavia was on her way to Athens with clothes and supplies for Antony's army, along with 70 ships and 2,000 soldiers to help him. Antony, though, was so ungrateful, he accepted the supplies, but told Octavia, his own wife, to go back home to Rome. He didn't want to see her. And it was incredibly clear that while Octavia was his legal wife, it was actually Cleopatra who Antony seemed to be having this meaningful relationship with. Also, let's not forget, back in Rome, Octavia was the one looking after her and Antony's children. And she was looking after... Antony's children by Fulvia from his third marriage and as Octavia's brother Octavian was understandably fuming he tried to convince Octavia to leave her and Antony's family home in Rome but she refused saying that he was still her husband so obviously public opinion started turning against Antony a little for his clear mistreatment against Octavia That wasn't really in the forefront of Antony's mind, though. Antony's priority was getting revenge for having been tricked by Artavardes of Armenia. He and his army stormed into Armenia and captured Artavardes and his family, taking them back to Alexandria with him. When he got back, Antony celebrated a triumph, which involved Antony entering Alexandria in a procession with Artavardes being dragged in chains and paraded around, much like the one that Arsinoe had to take part in. 
That was shocking to Rome. A triumph was a Roman tradition, and for Antony to celebrate a triumph in Egypt, in foreign land, was low-key sacrilege to the Roman people, adding another complaint to the pile against Antony amongst the Roman people. So we see the pot slowly bubbling and bubbling as public sentiment starts to see Mark Antony from being a powerful Roman military leader to a man being led astray by a foreign exotic queen. Antony, though, didn't really seem to care. He was busy building a life for himself and Cleopatra in Egypt. In 34 BC, Antony and Cleopatra hosted the donations of Alexandria, this magnificent ceremony where Cleopatra staged the greatest marketing campaign ever. Cleopatra was a master marketer. If she lived today, she'd be a director of a PR agency or she'd be Kim K. She would have her own makeup line or her own skims, because in the donations of Alexandria, you can see that Cleopatra put tons of thought into her image, Antony's image, her children's image, to show a really favourable, majestic picture to the Alexandrian people. Cleopatra dressed as the goddess Isis, and Antony took on the role of Isis's husband, the god Osiris. Osiris Greek equivalent would be the god Dionysus, who Antony frequently aligned himself with. The essential goal of the donations of Alexandria was to host a ceremony which outlined which of Cleopatra's children would inherit which lands in his part of the Roman Empire. Cleopatra and Antony sat on golden thrones, while the four children sat on lower thrones. Cleopatra was declared queen of kings. Caesarion, who was now 13 years old, was declared king of kings and co-ruler with Cleopatra but he was still on a lower throne it's pretty clear even from the donations of Alexandria that even though he was named co-ruler Cleopatra was still calling the shots the six-year-old Alexander was declared ruler of Armenia Medea and Parthia Alexander's twin sister Cleopatra received Crete and Cyrenica which is in eastern Libya Ptolemy who was two years old was given Syria and Cilicia which is in southern Turkey Coinage also shows that Antony and Cleopatra are portrayed as a typical couple with them posing as a married couple in portraits, although we're not sure whether they actually went through with the wedding ceremony and got married. At this point, Cleopatra was at an all-time high. She was ruler of the richest kingdom in the world. She'd almost got back all of the Ptolemaic territories. She was the lover of one of the most powerful men in the world. And she had successfully secured the future of her beloved children. And it's really interesting to note that she didn't intend on giving her oldest son everything. She splits all of the different territories to each of her children to secure each one of their futures. Stories circulated during Cleopatra's lifetime and for centuries afterwards of her extravagant and glamorous lifestyle. There were rumours of a huge drinking and partying culture at the Alexandrian court and excessive food preparations that the kitchen would make for Antony and Cleopatra. And the role of alcohol is quite prominent in both Cleopatra and Circe's stories. The role of alcohol in Cleopatra's story is to show just how extravagant and careless Cleopatra is about her queenship but for Circe she was initially disgusted by her husband King Robert's excessive drinking and then as she soon started climbing the political ladder and gaining more power she started heavily drinking and there were scenes in game of thrones where you wouldn't see her without a drink in her hand but that just shows how out of control she is and how insecure emotionally and inwardly but also outwardly how out of control she is in terms of the political situation There's also this one story where Cleopatra bet with Antony that she could spend the most amount of money at a single dinner. Cleopatra took one of her pearl earrings from her ear and dissolved it in vinegar to show just how little care she had to such valuable objects. But 
I'm side-eyeing that story a little bit because apparently pearls don't dissolve in vinegar. Maybe that was just a story to just show how extravagant Cleopatra was. Anyway, these stories helped to create this reputation that Cleopatra was a really frivolous, extravagant queen, spending money in a really obscene, disgusting way and dragging Antony along with her in all this debauchery and waywardness. While Antony was playing house with Cleopatra, the Roman people were starting to well and truly turn against Antony. Octavian, who off the back of winning various wars against the Illyrians, had emerged as well and truly the most powerful man in Rome, the two started a propaganda war where they were just attacking each other with insults and accusations. Cleopatra was also a target of propaganda abuse for Octavian and his supporters. They said that she was a witch, a poisoner, an extravagant spendthrift who had enslaved Antony into a life of sin and transgression. Worst of all, the donations of Alexandria had not gone down well with the Roman people at all, and Antony was accused of being so bewitched by Cleopatra that he was giving away Roman territory away to foreigners. Cleopatra was fashioned by Octavian and his faction as a real and serious threat to Rome as Antony's puppet master. Obviously, Antony fought back with counter-propaganda of his own, and it was inevitable that a civil war would break out for a third time in Cleopatra's lifetime, this time between Antony and Octavian. The final nail in the coffin was in 32 BC, when Antony announced that he was officially divorcing his wife Octavia. In response, Octavian went to the Vestal Virgins and asked if he could see Antony's will. When the Vestal Virgins said no, he just took it anyway, which is not allowed in Roman law or religion at all, by the way. He read the will out to the Roman populace, which apparently said that Caesarion was Caesar's heir, and therefore heir to Rome, and that the donations of Alexandria were legal, and so all of the Roman territory would become Egyptian. It also said that Antony wanted to be buried with Cleopatra in Egypt if he died, and that the capital of Rome would be moved to Alexandria. This properly fueled the fire of hatred against Antony and Cleopatra, as the Roman people were scared that their lands, their territories and their titles would be taken away from them and become Egyptian. And so, Rome declared war against Cleopatra. When the war started, Antony and Cleopatra had the edge numbers-wise. They had 800 ships and 100,000 troops, compared to Octavian's meagre number of 200 ships and 80,000 troops. Cleopatra also had the support from 11 kings, who would provide her with more men and resources. However, Cleopatra's troops just weren't as well trained compared to Octavian's men, and the 800 ships were useless if they didn't have the crews who knew how to use them. With Antony and Cleopatra, they had quantity, but Octavian had quality. Antony and Cleopatra spent the summer in Athens, where the people erected statues for them, with Cleopatra once again dressed as the goddess Isis. They then moved to Actium in Greece as a military base, and that is where Antony and Cleopatra stayed, where they decided that the appropriate strategy was for Octavian and his army to come to them, rather than initiating attacks on him. This might have been a fatal error for them. While I was doing my research, I read from one historian that they waited for Octavian rather than attacking him first. In other words, they gave Octavian time to get ready and put himself in the best position possible to attack Antony and Cleopatra. Soon enough, Octavian and his army started attacking naval base after naval base, successfully taking them despite Antony's efforts. Octavian soon seized enough of Antony's bases to cut his supply line so that they couldn't receive any resources like food and water. Worse still, people started to see where the tide was turning and it was clear that Octavian was going to win. It was just a matter of time. So more and more of Antony's supporters deserted him so that towns and cities which had been under Antony's control in the beginning of the war ended up being in Octavian's control. Even Antony's close friends started defecting, and when they did go to Octavian, they told him of what Antony's position was and what his plans were. So, now that Octavian had increasing control of lands and waters, Antony and Cleopatra were essentially trapped in Actium. The only way out for Antony and Cleopatra and their fleet was the Gulf of Ambracia, 
But Octavian had control of it. The only way that Antony and Cleopatra could leave Actium and the Gulf was to engage in battle against Octavian. So, on the 2nd of September, 31 BC, the decisive battle took place, called the Battle of Actium. Antony's fleet was on one side, Octavian's fleet was on the other side, and they started fighting. But, in the middle of all of the conflict, Cleopatra moved between the two fleets and started making her way out of the Gulf. Seeing what Cleopatra was doing and not fighting, Antony followed her and boarded her ship. Now, there are two potential reasons for Cleopatra's fleeing from the fighting. Either she took the opportunity herself to abandon Antony and save her own skin by escaping from the danger, or Antony and Cleopatra knew all along that they were probably going to lose the war and decided to sacrifice their ships in the Battle of Actium to sail safely away the minute they saw the chance, with Cleopatra leading the way and Antony following closely behind. Either way, Antony's other ships were sacrificed in the battle, with three quarters of his fleet captured or destroyed. Antony and Cleopatra were well and truly defeated. After their defeat, Antony and Cleopatra headed south in a three-day journey to Cape Matapan. Antony was not in a good place. He was really depressed and would not speak to Cleopatra. From then on, Antony went to Serenica to continue the war, but Cleopatra had other ideas. She was desperate to go back to Alexandria so that she could take control of the narrative of what had happened at the Battle of Actium so that the Alexandrian people wouldn't raise against her in anger. When Cleopatra arrived in Alexandria, she pretended that everything was fine, all was well, and that she had won a victory. Antony soon joined Cleopatra to Alexandria, When he got to Serenica, he found out that his governor had turned against him and had gone over to Octavian's side. King Herod of Judea was yet another defector. He met up with Octavian and gave a massive speech, pretending to be really candid and sincere, saying, I did support Antony, but now I will fully pledge my support to you, Octavian. And Octavian accepted And this can't have been the hardest decision for Herod to make. After all, Octavian was winning the civil war and Herod had to curry favour with him if he wanted to secure his position on the throne. Also, Herod and Cleopatra did not like each other. In Herod's eyes, Cleopatra had been stealing territory away from him and wanted more of it. Cleopatra had also been involved in Herod's family affairs, so there wasn't any real loyalty that Herod had to Antony or Cleopatra, so it was very easy to switch sides. Now that Antony had lost the war and had dwindling allies, Antony decided to go back to Alexandria. Now that he was back, Antony was quite frankly falling apart He had tried to commit suicide when he was in Serenica, and now he fell into a depression. Cleopatra had to start taking control. In terms of what Antony and Cleopatra's situation was now, they had lost the war against Octavian, and they knew that Octavian was going to come for them with his army to Egypt. For the next year, Antony and Cleopatra separately sent messages to Octavian to try and negotiate with him. Cleopatra promised that she would give up the Egyptian throne, but she still wanted her children to inherit the throne and continue the Ptolemaic dynasty. Octavian didn't really say whether he'd be happy with this arrangement, but he did say that Cleopatra would be spared if she killed Antony, and that was something Cleopatra just wasn't prepared to do, because taking into account that Antony had been told also to kill Cleopatra by numerous other people and his advisors had recommended that he abandon Cleopatra and that was something he wasn't going to do. Cleopatra wasn't really in a position to do that either and I feel like that shows there was real love between them even if Cleopatra was a homewrecker which she was. Meanwhile Antony said that he was prepared to live the rest of his life as a private citizen as well but Octavian didn't even reply to him he left Antony on red. Um, But in July 30 BC, Octavian finally arrived in Alexandria and Antony and his army went to meet them. However, Antony suffered more defections from his own army and Octavian entered Alexandria without much of a fight. 
Cleopatra locked herself with her treasure in her tomb with her closest attendants. She also had a message sent to Antony to tell her that she was dead, maybe to get him to commit suicide knowing that he was vulnerable in terms of his mental health. When Antony did get the message that Cleopatra was supposedly dead, he stabbed himself in the stomach. Some say that Antony was aiming for his heart but missed and stabbed his stomach, but others say he deliberately did it so that he would have to endure a really long, painful death. Either way, Antony was now dying. Cleopatra heard what Antony had done and ordered that Antony be brought to her. When Antony reached Cleopatra, she was at a window on the top floor of the tomb, and if you're thinking, wow, that's some tomb, for it to be multiple stories high, Yeah, the Egyptians built some elaborate tombs for them to be laid to rest because they believed that a pharaoh in their afterlife would be one with the gods. So the place in which they housed had to be appropriately extravagant and majestic for a pharaoh. Cleopatra and her attendants had to get cables and hoist Antony up to the window and get him inside the tomb. And as Antony lay in Cleopatra's arms dying, he told her only to trust one Gaius Proculius, one of his men. And so Mark Antony died in his lover's arms, the arms of a woman who arguably led to his death. Now, there are two stories of how Cleopatra subsequently dies. The first one is that Cleopatra does a Romeo and Juliet and kills herself in the tomb shortly after Mark dies. The second, longer version of Cleopatra's death is that Gaius Proculius, who Antony told Cleopatra to only trust, had actually defected to Octavian's side and Octavian ordered him to capture Cleopatra alive. The doors to the tomb were sealed, so Proculius couldn't go in that way, but he did notice the window that had been used to get Antony into the tomb, so he got a ladder and quickly climbed up and entered the tomb. When he got there, Cleopatra apparently tried to commit suicide, but Proculius prevented her from doing so by disarming her, and then she was taken back to the royal palace at Alexandria. With Octavian's permission, Cleopatra embalmed Antony's body, which was an Egyptian and not Roman tradition, and Antony was worried. Cleopatra then learned that Octavian would return to Rome, taking her and her children with him so that they could participate in a Roman triumph. This might have been a trick plotted by Octavian to make Cleopatra commit suicide because he didn't want her blood on his hands. In terms of optics, that would not look good. A triumph would also have been humiliating for Cleopatra. It's something that's comparable to Circe when she was walking through the streets in the shame situation. And knowing that she would probably be killed after she was paraded around in a triumph, Cleopatra would probably thought that death would have been more acceptable to her. In August 30 BC, Cleopatra asked for permission to visit Antony's grave. She then had dinner, including some figs that had been brought in by a basket. Then Cleopatra locked herself away with her attendants and a message was sent to Octavian. This message, which was from Cleopatra, asked that Cleopatra be buried alongside Octavian. Essentially, this message told Octavian that Cleopatra planned to commit suicide. Octavian rushed with his soldiers to see Cleopatra and found her laid out in her royal attire and her attendants dead or near death. Cleopatra, at the grand old age of 39 years old, had died. We can't fully confirm how Cleopatra died. Apparently she was found with these tiny prick marks on her body and that's just it was either by a needle or pin, maybe poison. Others and lots of people, it's the common thought in society today, believes that Cleopatra died by asp and they believe that the asp was hidden in the fig basket but who knows. After Cleopatra's death, Egypt became a Roman province under Octavian's rule. Cleopatra's eldest son, Caesarian, Julius Caesar's only known son and obvious threat to Octavian's rule was killed. The rest of Cleopatra's children left Alexandria and the twins, Alexander and Cleopatra, were taken care by Octavia, Antony's wife back in Rome. That woman was a saint. Anyway, Octavian became Emperor Augustus, and under his rule, the territories that Cleopatra had worked so hard to acquire and get back were cut up and divided between Rome and its allied kings. Cleopatra was to be the last active Ptolemaic ruler, and her death marked the end of Ptolemaic rule over the Egyptian kingdom. 
history, Cleopatra is remembered as the ultimate femme fatale, using her feminine wiles to get what she wanted, and that ultimately led to her downfall. In Game of Thrones, Cersei Lannister is similarly known for her sexual relationships in order to use men for her political purposes. And these qualities are viewed with a lot of disdain and judgement by others. I argue that Cleopatra and Cersei Lannister are both slut-shamed for using their attractiveness as a political weapon. But at the same time, if you have a skill, then surely you should use it in order to get ahead in life and succeed because the idea that it's really unattractive and unwomanly for a woman to take on masculine aggressive qualities and politics leads to a woman simply being in politics as a damned if you do damned if you don't situation you're criticized if you're being manly and aggressive in politics but you're also criticized for using your feminine qualities on politics you just can't please anyone For example, in a conversation with Olena Tyrell, Cersei Lannister says, ah yes, the famously tart-tongued Queen of Thorns, to which Olena says, and the famous tart Queen Cersei. Meanwhile, Cleopatra is a name that is synonymous with sex appeal, lust and extravagance, using her sexuality to ensnare men in her devious traps, and the idea of people using their sexuality to further themselves politically is just unfathomable to people but let's not forget Cleopatra and Cersei were also political animals neither were above killing their enemies even if they were family members Cleopatra was responsible for killing all of her surviving siblings whether that be directly or indirectly meanwhile Cersei killed her own husband so that they could secure power for themselves and their children Cleopatra and Cersei were women who I believe, transcended the expected gender roles for them within their societies. It was simply unfathomable to Egyptian society for a woman to be the sole ruler of a kingdom. So Cleopatra used that system to her gain, putting her son on the throne as co-ruler so that she could have proper, full, de facto control of the Egyptian kingdom. Circe did the exact same, eventually becoming queen in her own right. Cleopatra and Circe were also very much their father's daughters, seeking to emulate their policies and qualities. Cleopatra saw that her father, Ptolemy XII's grip on power and on the Egyptian throne, heavily relied on his friendship with Rome, and when she succeeded him to the throne, took on pro-Roman policies of her own. She took it one step further in a way that Ptolemy couldn't ever do as a man. She used these powerful Roman men, and with them the power of Rome, to expand her kingdom. Cersei's father, Tywin Lannister, was known throughout Westeros as definitely the richest man in the kingdom, but also the most powerful. He put all of his faith in his son Jaime to further the Lannister line, but it was Cersei who did something that even Tywin couldn't do, take the crown for Westeros for herself, even if it was for a very short time. Cersei even says that she wished that she was a man, that she should have been a man, because of all the potential and intelligence that she saw in herself. Also, Cleopatra and Cersei weren't just doing this for themselves, they were tirelessly working so that their children could inherit and have smooth transitions into power. Despite their efforts though, Cleopatra and Cersei's children never lived to inherit the power that the two women enjoyed in the peak of their rules. Also, both Cleopatra and Cersei's reigns ended with them. These were women whose efforts during their lifetimes ultimately ended up being futile. But that brings us to the end of the third episode of the Loud Girl Talks History podcast. I hope you enjoyed this month's pod on Cleopatra. If you did, subscribe, like and leave a review and I'll see you on the next one.